Alors, bonsoir tout le monde. Bienvenue à cette soirée SMPTE sur les transmissions sur les signaux des VBS2 avec les changements. Ce soir, nous avons les gens de NewTech qui vont, viennent nous présenter euh, tous ces nouveaux changements au niveau des standards. Alors, euh, il y a Diana Cantu qui est la représentante euh, au niveau Canada et on a M. Will Su qui va euh, faire la présentation qui est en charge au niveau du support euh, pour les Amériques. Alors, euh, Will, it's up to you. Thank you. Thanks again for your time. Uh, okay, so basically today we're, we're going to talk about the DVBS2 update up to last week, because so last week uh, there's some new development. So very quickly, we uh, just uh, looking back uh, in 1993 time frame, we started uh, the digital TV uh, direct to home service. At that time, we have uh, DVBS. And uh, very quickly, that's for country uh, distribution. So very quickly, in around 1998, we have uh, DVB DSNG to take care of the contribution because we can use a higher modulation scheme and uh, better efficiency uh, over the satellite. And uh, in around 1995, uh, it evolved uh, into DVB S2. It's meant to replace uh, uh, DVBS and uh, DVB SNG. And if you look at the name, the second generation framing structure, channel coding and modulation for broadcasting, interactive service, news gathering, and other broadband satellite application. We know DVBS2, when it comes, it already changed everything. It's a revolutionary change from DVBS and the DVB DSNG because uh, the framing structure, coding, modulation all changed. Another one is uh, application wise, it's meant for distribution, like a DTH, it's meant for contribution, DSNG, and also for the interactive service. In the early days, when you want to transmit data, you have to use something called MPE to encapsulate it, convert it into transport stream, so you can go through the satellite, because the people are familiar with how to transmit a transport stream over satellite, but it's very inefficient. So DVBS to take that away and also introduced something called the GSE, it's the most efficient encapsulation method. You are, don't have to go back to transport stream if you want to do data. So the DVBS2 already considered this interactive service and also broadband service. That's why since 2005, it pretty much changed the whole landscape of uh, satellite transmission, not just on video, but also on data. Because if you look at uh, the satellite uh, transponder uh, occupancy today over the satellites, uh, video pretty probably only like uh, occupy half of them. Another half is uh, data. So in 2005, uh, they released uh, uh, DVBS2, and then in 2006, they released uh, one more release to fix uh, some of the error in the APSK spec spectrum efficiency. In 2009, they accepted a new tech uh, proposal to add uh, a structure to tell the modulator how to modulate a signal if people construct your baseband outside the modulator. So they introduced a structure to use a U2 transport stream byte to tell the modulator what kind of frame I want, do I want a pilot or not, what kind of modulation I want. So that's the uh, third release. And uh, 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 early, uh, middle last year, they introduced another one. It will be, uh, right now, DVB Blue Book A83 is already published but uh, the, uh, they already gave the standard name uh, 1.31, but it hasn't been finalized yet. It will be the same, just to go through the purpose. The last update is to prepare DVBS2 for the KA band broadcast, when you have like a 250 megahertz transponder. Before, when people talk about the KA band, they always think about data transmission, but actually KA is going to be in video sooner or later and uh, most likely it will be sooner. Because if you look at in states, uh, like uh, people start using the spot beam to do some contribution. And uh, because it's KA, you can, be, you can have a very small dish, especially for the flyaway, people are already doing it. And uh, right now there are lots of uh, initiative going on to use the spot beam to do broadcast, especially when content uh, need to be localized. So this is a DVB S2. 
And uh, back then, when two, I remember 2005, when DVBS2 introduced, uh, people say this will be the last standard. There will be no more DVBS3. Why? Because uh, at the QPSK, APSK, it's only one dB away from Shannon limit. So people will think uh, there, the chance is very low. People is going to push that uh, one dB to find a better uh, 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 coding scheme. However, that's not a choice. Less than 10 years, now we're talking about S2 extension because uh, the big driver we know whenever you talk about satellite is uh, the high cost of transponder. And uh, whenever you can increase your efficiency, people will do it. Another one is right now DISH, the, uh, the, the, the technology on the DISH, it's uh, getting better and better and the transponder is getting more and po more powerful. Before, like uh, you have a, a DSNG truck, you are talking about APSK, you are laughing. And uh, now, 16 APSK, and even 32 APSK. Because uh, like uh, right now from uh, NFL football uh, playoff from US to uh, Europe is uh, using 32 APSK going through Toronto. So 32 APSK is there and uh, people are not going to just uh, happy with uh, a lower modulation scheme. They're going to push the envelope. So that's why, like, uh, especially since last year, NewTek uh, in February, last February, NewTek uh, took the initiative, uh, team up with uh, Arabset, uh, Cisco, SES, and Thompson, and uh, to uh, submit it, uh, a proposal to DVB organization and try to put uh, the improvement of DVBS2 on the agenda. The reason is, uh, and if you want to initiate anything to the DVB organization, you have to have at least five members to, uh, to, to submit uh, this uh, uh, request. That's why we team up with uh, these guys. We think uh, this is like a complete uh, satellite transmission food chain. And they take care of the satellite operator, the video guys, the data guys. And that's the future of uh, satellite transmission. Not just the video, not just of data, but uh, everything combined together. And uh, 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 so last year, that's uh, February. And then the first uh, option, uh, the first uh, action a DVB organization is going to do is there is a commercial module. They have to come up with a commercial requirement to justify what kind of application is out there which will use this new technology. So after about a year, that job is done. And uh, uh, at the meeting on 16th uh, January, the DVB organization technical module submitted, uh, uh, published a document. It's called Call for Technology for Evolutionary, Evolutionary Subsystem for DVB S, uh, for S2 system. So basically, it's like, uh, okay, the commercial requirement has been defined. Now they ask for everybody to submit the technical proposal to write the standard to realize uh, the, the, uh, the in, uh, improvement. So basically, right now, there is a, a still a debate. It's going to call the DBS3 or it's going to call the DBS2 extension. So right now, S2 extension is a... a, a what uh, new tech called because uh, we think uh, uh, right now the, it, it asks for strong backward compatibility of uh, S2. So we still call it uh, S2 extension. Eventually, they're going to call it uh, S3 or whatever. It's going to be decided by DVB organization. But uh, that, that's not the point. The point is uh, we're going to look at how much more efficiency we gain, what kind of improvement uh, we actually made. So that uh, uh, proposal deadline is uh, February this year. It's coming. So and uh, in next, we will be doing lots of uh, eva uh, simulation evaluation. Because uh, back in the DVBS days, that's when people actually made the prototype and go to the DVB organization and say, "Hey, I have something to transmit a digital TV signal. Give it, give it a try." And the uh, DVB DSNG actually is a new tech uh, standard. We actually take our equipment, go to DVB, said, hey, we can do APSK and the 16 Kong. It's already here. Thank you. But uh, when it comes to DVBS2, it's too complicated because uh, right now there's so many processing involved. It's, uh, it, you have to use a computer simulation to 
validate the coding and the modulation before you actually go out to write your software and put on FPGA and to actually come up with a unit. So DBB S2 extension will be the same. However, new tech uh, right now we are uh, in the leading. We believe we are leading because we already have our equipment running and we are going to give our uh, 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 technology to the DBB organization. Because if you look at back, new tech is always a strong believer of uh, open standard. In broadcast, if you don't go with uh, open standard, if you don't have a way to have a cheap ASIC at the receive end, it's not going to fly. That's why whenever we have some new stuff, we always give to DVB organization. It turned out it will also help us. So uh, right now, the goal of uh, uh, DVB uh, organization is uh, by September, we'll have this uh, new standard uh, finalized. So about one and, a half, one and a half years, and uh, it will become reality. So this is a statement in this uh, current uh, call for technology publication. So the current goal of a TV, uh, a technical module S2 is the delivery of a technical standard enabling the delivery of a significantly higher data rate between 15 to 30. So the, the generally is if uh, the improvement of efficiency is not uh, like around 20 plus percent, don't even try. Because uh, people think, especially uh, the, the VB organization will think it doesn't worth it to have a new standard because that's going to affect uh, from equipment uh, manufacturer all the, all the way down to the receive end. So if you want to propose something, you better have a decent uh, improvement to worth uh, the effort. Another one is uh, uh, in a given transponder. On the other hand, you can also say it's a delivery of the same data rate at a significantly lower SNR without a fundamental change to the complexity and the structure of DBBS2. Because after 10 years, DBBS2 finally come to the position today, definitely you want a broadcaster have option in hand. You don't want to tell them, say, hey, you just, you just upgraded to S2, now it's obsolete, you, you need another one. You don't like that because you always want them to have a like, you know, scheduled migration plan. So this new standard is going to have a strong com backward compatibility with S2. However, it's the same thing. If you are going to imp increase your efficiency, on the other hand, basically you are saying, I'm transmitting the same data, but I'm going to use a lower signal to noise ratio, right? So you can keep the power. On the other hand, if you have the power, you can bump up, use the power you saved, bump up the modulation and coding skin, which turned out will be the more efficiency. So it's the same thing. So what's in this uh, uh, new standard? There is a, 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 right now the proposal new tech is going to uh, present and also is already carried out uh, in our existing equipment. Even though right now we still have to call it a preparatory because it hasn't been uh, standardized. It's basically have this component inside. First is a uh, lower raw factor. Uh, today, like uh, DVBS to have 20%, 25%, 35%, and uh, we introduced the uh, 5%, 10%, 15%. And uh, in new tech, our equipment right now, we call it uh, clean channel technology. Because we know if, uh, like uh, for a linear modulation, your occupied bandwidth, when you go to a satellite operator to rent, it's your symbol rate times uh, one plus alpha. Alpha is your raw factor, right? So the lower the raw factor in the given occupied bandwidth, the higher symbol rate you can put in. The higher symbol rate you put in, the more data rate comes out. So it's strongly tied to the efficiency. The second one is uh, going to, we're going to increase uh, the FEC choice, providing the highest resolution for optimal modulation in all circumstances with the ESNO range from minus three to 19. That's a big, big dynamic range. Even in DVB-S, DVB-DSNG days, the dynamic range is about 11 dB. So right now, it's really like expand on the low end, which will be very helpful with like a cheap receiver, small dish. And also on the high end, you have a good big dish, but you really want to pump lots, lots of data for like a cable restoration, IP backbone, whatever. 
And uh, another one is on the horizon, is this Ultra HD. And later on, we're going to uh, touch upon it. And uh, because so now you can go to 19 dB, so immediately we introduced something called 64 APSK. And actually, we already did the test on Utosat satellite. You can, with 30 meter dish, you can do 64 APSK. It's not uh, something people will think uh, there is no way you can do it without a gigantic uh, and, uh, dish. You can do it. And when you push to six, 64 APSK, and uh, later on we have a diagram of uh, constellation, you'll see where, why it's going to give us so many more efficiency. Uh, another one is add FEC point. Right now, DVBS2 got uh, 28 FEC uh, modulation coding point. So when you, when you want to use a satellite to transmit anything, the first thing you have to do is link budget, right? So depending on where your link budget set, you have to choose if the step of your choice is much bigger and your link budget is right in between, you have nowhere to go but to step down because you have to keep your availability figure over the satellite. When you step down, basically you lose, you wasted your power. So what uh, this DVBS to extension is going to do is, uh, okay, DVBS, when the right standard, their concept of step is 1 dB. Jump 1 dB in signal to noise ratio when you change another modulation coding. And the DVBS to extension is going to shrink that to a quarter dB. So anytime you do a link budget, you have much, much higher chance to find a modulation and coding point right there for you. So that's uh, the improvement. And uh, another one is a better matching between constellation and the FEC rate for linear and non-linear channel. In the old days, even DVBS2, or you, you say DVBS, DVB, DSNG, DVBS2, it's the same thing. It's all just treats a satellite as a linear channel. They never consider the non-linear uh, modulation. So, but uh, we know when you do saturation or close to saturation, not, uh, uh, not every FEC uh, uh, modulation coding point is created equal. So what uh, we are going to propose is uh, let's separate the channel. Some modulation coding is very good for multi-carrier linear channel. And we can also find some modulation coding, which is very good for like a DTH, like uh, you know, CBC, if they want to broadcast uh, the whole country, normally they want to saturate the transponder, make the best use of the power of the transponder and make all the receive, uh, no matter you are in West Coast, East Coast, no far North, easier to receive. So in this kind of a saturated uh, broadcast uh, situation, you can find a better coding for it. So that's also uh, a very fundamental change. And the last one is uh, now we are going to really go wideband. And uh, we have 70 megahertz transponder, but before it's always limited uh, like to 68 megabaht, uh, stuff like that. Now we are really go full steam on 72 megabaht because uh, more and more satellite operator is open for the uh, customer to use as a guard band. Like a 72 megahertz transponder, actually it's 80 megahertz but uh, they keep uh, four makers on each side as a guard band in case uh, people will have uh, interference uh, to the adjacent uh, carrier. But uh, with a better uh, technology on the carrier shape, then they are more and more open to let people step into the guard band. Then you can really use a 72 megabaht signal. That will also increase the efficiency greatly because the symbol rate you choose a better um, FEC uh, and modulation, that will direct result will be more data rate. That's uh, what we want. So this is uh, pretty much all the te technical uh, advancement which will be included in this S2 extension, or some people still call it a DVB-SX because they don't know what's uh, going to be. So let's take a closer look uh, of the clean channel technology. You see, this is a t the top one. That's uh, the DVBS to 25 percent. See, uh, this is a DVB mask, and uh, at NewTek we always uh, put higher requirement on ourselves. So our uh, mask is uh, it's always tighter than the standard. And you can see first the steep, the slope is not that steep, 
and uh, you know you see much higher side lobe. And uh, the occupied bandwidth is 3 dB down from the top of the carrier times uh, 1 plus alpha. That's why if you look at the 5% row off, you see it's much steeper. So if you keep your symbol rate 3 dB down, your occupied bandwidth is much lower. But uh, normally the satellite transponder, they're not going to sell whatever megahertz you want, right? They always slice the transponder, tell you, no, 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 this is the minimum you have to take. Six megahertz, nine megahertz, 12, 18, 36. You cannot just say, I only need uh, 3.5, right? But the thing is with the six you bought, if you use a lower raw factor, you can put much higher symbol rate inside. So this is uh, where the efficiency will come from. And so it's not just the efficiency. This is a plot. If you compare, this is a 30 meg, uh, megabot uh, carrier. So if you look at uh, first the top, because uh, use advanced uh, uh, filtering, the noise on the carrier is cleaner. The slope is much steeper. And also, if you look at the side slope, it was really pressed on another 7 dB or something like that. Because uh, think about that. Another way, whenever people use transponder, right? They go out, they have a multi-carrier situation. They want to put two carriers as close as possible. But what is going to stop them to put very close is this, right? Because uh, when you put two carriers very close, this uh, side lobe will creep up and become your noise. Once you go over minus 26 dB down from the carrier top, you are not allowed to do that because that's how they define occupied bandwidth. So if you want to put two carriers closer, then you need to really suppress this part. And then you use 5% ROF, you can really put two carriers very, very close. So that's the clean channel technology. So it's not just about 5%, 10%, 15%. It's also clean up the whole carrier spectrum. Now let's look at uh, adding more uh, 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 FEC rate, how that's going to help us. So this is uh, DVBS2, 20%, right? Suppose your link budget, so right now you have a uh, carrier to noise ratio of 6, right? So you look up, you can do APSK to third. This blue one, that's a 5% raw factor. So now the whole uh, uh, modulation chain is a uh, 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 graph is like this, step is like this. So if you say I still keep the 6 dB signal to noise ratio, you go up, you see here, if you use 5%, you get about 3% uh, more efficiency gain, right? But if, say, you have about a half a dB more power, before, in the old days, you still have to stay on the APSK two-thirds, right? But with DVBS2 extension, now you can jump up to the next step. The higher step you go, the more efficient your transmission will be. So from here, you can say when you have more choice, given the same power or within the same power you were doing the old uh, F modulation coding, now you can have significant gain up to 15% up to in theory, depending on how much power you have. So here also, by looking at this one, you know which part gives you better efficiency improvement, then that will help you when you design your system. This is uh, what uh, I was uh, mentioning before. Say when you want to put the two carriers very close together, if you don't clean up the side lobe at a certain point, they will tell you, no, you cannot do that. We have to maintain channel spacing in order to uh, guarantee there is no uh, 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 adjacent uh, carrier interference. But if you clean up your side lobe, you can really put two carriers much closer. And uh, if you rent the same transponder, that might allow you to put more one more carrier inside, depending on how big the carrier is. 
So it's very significant. So this is, uh, this is uh, the blow up. Say before this is uh, TVPS and uh, TVPS2. Uh, now we are TVPS2 extension. It's closer and closer to the Shannon limit. So Shannon limit basically is uh, the, the theoretic uh, limit. And uh, I don't think anybody, some people say they, they want to cross it, but uh, a serious engineer will say there is no way because uh, the Shannon limit pretty much tell you if you want to move information from point A to point B in a white Gaussian uh, channel and uh, in a quasi error free environment transmission, normally that means like a 10 to the minus seven bit error rate. This is a minimum as a signal to noise ratio you have to maintain. Otherwise, uh, you cannot do quasi error free transmission. So this is uh, the limit all the satellite communication engineer trying to go closer and closer and closer. So today we are here and I guess uh, after this S2 extension there will be nobody make a claim this will be the last, <laughs> last uh, standard uh, forever because you can see at higher modulation 32 APSK, 64 APSK, there's still room for improvement. And the transponder is getting powerful, it's getting more and more powerful. If you give me more powerful transponder, I make a better dish, I find a better way to implement the modulation coding scheme, I can go closer and closer. So I, I guess uh, maybe another 10 years, uh, people will put out uh, something else. Just like uh, the, uh, the, the, the graph uh, indicate, when you have more steps, so every time when you do link budget, it's very easier to you, for you to find uh, a mod cut point for your link budget. So you don't waste uh, any uh, power you have. That means efficiency. So, and uh, 64 APSK really push it uh, to, a, to a higher level on that uh, efficiency thing. Because right now you can reach five bits Per hertz. Another one is uh, we talk about uh, the optimum mod cut, uh, mod cut to differentiate uh, linear channel and along linear channel. When you have uh, uh, when you have when you try to saturate the transponder, what people want to do is first find the optimum back off. So I can go back to uh, linear uh, operation, but I use minimum, minimum uh, 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 back off if I know what will be the degradation when you try to go saturation. So what uh, new tech did uh, and we are going to propose is uh, let's uh, find uh, another parameter which not, which uh, based on your signal to noise ratio and also consider at a certain mod cut what could be the optimum back off or minimum back off and what will be the nonlinear degradation associated with that specific modulation and coding point. And use this as a parameter to define what will be the best modulation and coding for linear channel and nonlinear channel. So that's uh, what uh, uh, we're going to do for this S2 extension. So later on, uh, at a new standard, you get two sets of mod modulation and coding. One set is for linear channel, one set is for long linear channels. Then you know, okay, if I'm going to do uh, a multi-carrier, I'm going to go with uh, linear modulation and coding selection. That gives me best uh, uh, efficiency. If I'm going to try to saturate, or really I'm going to saturate, then I'm going to go with uh, long linear channel modulation coding, which is more robust for this kind of uh, operation condition. That's uh, something new in this uh, S2 extension before we don't have that. New tech has. <laughs> About two years ago, our engineer, because before people always know, when you try to saturate a transponder, there will be degradation, but uh, people cannot quantify it. If you cannot quantify, the only thing you can do is in your link margin uh, reservation when you do link budget, 
you give it a little bit more link margin, right? You don't know how much it is. You you put a two dB implementation margin. You give you depend on your uh, availability. You want to use. You give it a more link margin. About uh, two years ago, we finally figured out. We find a way to uh, quantify the degradation per modulation and coding point. In uh, we have the technology called uh, Note noise and uh, distortion estimation. So if you know what is your degradation, then when you do link budget, you don't have to reserve too much link margin for it. You can really push it, especially uh, uh, if you guys uh, use uh, ACM, you say this is very, very important. Because ACM, what ACM does is uh, before you just transmit, you do a link budget, right? Especially for uh, DTH, it's very, very uh, conservative because you want anybody to receive it. You don't want uh, there is a little bit of weather change, people start calling. So you are very conservative. Later on, people find out, uh, hey, like, you know, around, uh, for example, around the Canada, it's so wide a country, people have a different kind of a received condition. If you only have uh, what we call CCN, constant modulation coding for everybody, you basically penalize the guys uh, sitting there, right, with a bigger, better dish, with better weather condition. So then they realize, let's do VCN. If I know my content to different uh, uh, receive site is different, then I can do something called VCN, variable coding and modulation. So I don't have to penalize the guys uh, with a better receive condition. I do separate link budget per receive. And then people go one step further, say, if you do VCM, you still have to reserve a little bit of link margin, right, to, uh, for the weather change, for the uh, con receive condition degradation. So they introduced something called ACM in the S2, DVB-S2. It's called adaptive modulation coding. So basically said, if you constantly tell me your receive condition, then on my forward, I can always give you the modulation the coding you can afford at that certain point. I change as you receive as your con receive condition change. So that's called ACM. That's implemented uh, everywhere. I uh, pretty much everywhere. Pretty much everywhere. Uh, at least uh, for new tech, our implementation always have that. Because uh, if you can do that, you take all the link margin away. Because I don't need it. Because I always know your link change. Right? Your link is going uh, uh, degraded. I'm going to drop my modulation coding. If uh, the uh, cloud goes away, rain goes away, sunshine comes out, then I bump up the modulation coding. So all you, all you get to prepare is uh, when the link is going down, your link is still there. But since the modulation coding is going down, the symbol rate is the same, your data rate will drop. But at least you have a link instead of totally cut off. So then we know, if we know uh, the degradation of each modulation coding, we take that away, then we can fully use whatever link margin you have. That's uh, the beauty of uh, ACM. This is uh, today, I can only say this is today what we propose. So you have a two set for the linear channel and for the non-linear channel. And uh, some of the modulation and coding is good for linear, some of them are good for non-linear. But uh, now you have a choice. You have a choice to optimize your link. And uh, you can say this, uh, this is a step. It, you, it's more granular and it's more efficient than today. This is S2, this is S2 extension. And uh, this number is changing all the time until the finalize. They will nail down to exactly what will be in the standard. And actually today we already proposed the 87 and we have more, but uh, it will come down to finally what uh, the DVB organization will settle down with. But uh, uh, you know in the DVBS2, they have uh, something called a physical layer header. Physical layer header, they have a 90 symbol there. Right now they only use five symbol to represent uh, modulation and coding because uh, five symbol, two to the power of five is 32, can already cover today's uh, 28 uh, modulation coding. And uh, 
you add uh, a couple more symbols, you can easily accommodate uh, the new modulation coding in the new standard. That's why right now, actually, DVBS2 reception is very, very smart because uh, all the transmission parameter, except uh, the frequency and, uh, and your symbol rate, is already embedded in the physical layer of S2 carrier. So like if you use new tech equipment, you just put it in auto mode. You don't have to tell the receiver what the modulation coding to look for. We automatically go to the physical layer header of your S2 carrier to read, and then we know right away, oh, you are doing APSK three quarter. Then we automatically tell the receiver, just uh, decode at APSK three quarter, because all the information is already embedded in the physical layer header, including are you using frame normal type, a uh, normal frame or short frame? Is there a pilot or not? It's all there. It's very intelligent. But uh, DVBS2 will take the efficiency one step further. But uh, they want to keep the whole structure, the whole physical layer structure and the DVBS2 baseband the header structure. This is how it's going to look like constellation-wise. You have a QPSK will stay, APSK will stay, 16 APSK will stay. And we know before we have 16 quam, but uh, that's gone. Because 16 quam, you have a square constellation. Square constellation, if you want to transmit in a, like, uh, you know, uh, in a linear region, you have to back off a lot. I, I, I hear like anywhere from 5 dB to 7, 8 dB. So you spend lots of money, put a powerful transponder in the sky, you have to back off <laughs> 5 to 8 dB. That's totally a waste of, uh, 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 of the power. So what DVBS2 does is uh, bring that uh, constellation, square constellation inside and make it second ring. So that's why it's called 16 APSK. A stands for amplitude. So by going second ring, 16 APSK, the back off will be much, much less than 16 quam. But uh, you can only do two ring. You cannot put 16 dots uh, in one ring. That uh, will put a huge, huge pressure on, the F, uh, on your receiver phys uh, phase noise. That's why they do two ring. And when you go to 32 APSK, two ring is not enough. They have to do three ring. And this is 64 APSK. So the Today, it's, it's possible, one is uh, uh, you got the power, another one is because right now the FPGA is more and more powerful. And once FPGA is uh, get it done, finalized, mature, they turn it into ASIC. And then you can have a reasonably priced uh, receiver with ASIC chip. So that will make the whole thing possible. That's why new tech also believe in open standard. We always, yeah, most of the time we are one step ahead of uh, standardization, but once there is a standardization initiative going on, we always give it uh, to, the, uh, to the standardization group, in including our generic string encapsulation. The most efficient uh, data encapsulation method, uh, we also give whatever we have to the standard organization to be considered to be part of the standard. So this is uh, going to be S2 extension or X3 or SX, whatever. This is what we did. In June, at u uh, set, we used uh, 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 the uh, transponder 10A or W2A, and uh, we used uh, uh, the new modulation skin 30 APSK 135 over 180, and we used what we call bandwidth cancellation technology. So basically, like when you put a forward carrier and you put a return carrier, that's normal, right? But if you put your return carrier also at the same transponder of your forward carrier, and if you can find a way at each receive site to filter out what you meant to receive, that will be a significant saving of transponder. And that's, what, uh, that's a technology we call it bandwidth cancellation. So that's what we did. We can put 500 megabits in a 72 megahertz transponder. And uh, internally, we call it uh, <laughs> a record breaking. So far, as far as we know, that's uh, the highest data rate ever passed a 72 megahertz transponder. Because, uh, like, uh, 
uh, like we discussed, uh, we talked about before, satellite transmission, you have two pressure. On the data side is uh, the terrestrial solution, the fiber. It's really squeeze uh, satellite guys uh, so hard. So you have to find a way to be able to at least compete with the ground. Because on the ground, people pay how much money per megabits. They don't care you use a satellite, how you use satellite, you use S2, S2 extension, you use bandwidth cancellation a lot. They don't care. All they care is how, what's your price for, me, uh, for megabits. So on the data side, we have to find the most efficient way, including encapsulation, to cut out the, the overhead to put more bits over the transponder. On the video side, later on we're going to uh, talk about is uh, this uh, Arco HDTV. That's why they put pressure for the compression guys to the uh, satellite transmission guys to like you know bring the better stuff out. So this is uh, what we did. It's really record uh, breaking, and uh, actually we also hope somebody can break it, and uh, including ourselves break it because this gave uh, data transmission a uh, potential to compete with uh, with the guys on the ground. Okay, on the video side, uh, early this month, Utoset uh, announced they're going to put first Ultra HD uh, channel on their, on their transponder 10A. And uh, what they're going to do is to transmit one Ultra HD, you need four HD channel. And each HD, right now, they use MPEG-4 because uh, the, new, the new one, the HE, uh, the high efficiency uh, video code, co uh, coding, they haven't been standardized. Hopefully, like uh, I, I heard, I think it's uh, 2014. And uh, right now, they're talking about uh, either double the efficiency of MPEG-4 or at least 40% uh, improvement. But uh, today, it's not there, or they call it uh, H2.65. <laughs> So Utoset is going to use MPEG-4 for this transmission. Every channel is going to be 40 megabits. So just imagine, if you want to do one Ultra HD today, you need uh, four times 40 megabits. Even a normal 36 megabit transponder cannot even accommodate one program. So if there is no better way on the compression side, and no better way on the transmission side, that it's not going to, uh, business-wise, uh, Ultra HD over satellite is not going to fly. And uh, if you only do it on the ground, that's, that's going to put lots of people like new tech out of business, <laughs> especially on the video side. So we have to answer the challenge. It's just like uh, when DVBS2 comes out. DVBS2 got uh, widely accepted Basically, it's for HD channel, right? People have a better MPEG-4, and uh, then you have S2. That make HD a viable business. Now you look, uh, there are so many like DirecTV and uh, EchoStar. You have so many HD programming. If they don't have these two components to take care of business on the compression and the transmission side, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So this is a video side the challenge, which we believe that will push the S2 extension really be accepted by the operators. So in summary, there's about uh, seven improvements. First is a small raw factor, we saw it. And another one is advanced filtering technology for improved carrier spacing, right? We can, because uh, the suppressor side lobe, you can put two carrier closer and closer. The third one is a supporting different network configuration, which means with this DVBS2 extension, because they have a strong backward compatibility and because uh, on the side lobe of the carrier is really taking care of business. In one transponder, you can mix. You can have uh, S2, you can have S2 extension. There, there will be no conflict. And uh, that uh, flexibility given to the operator will help uh, the acceptance of the new standard. And uh, improvement four is increased uh, granity of uh, modcard point. We saw that uh, on that uh, blue curve. And uh, improvement five is higher modulation scheme up to 64 APSK. 
And the six is a different class for linear and nonlinear multicard. Now we are going to have two set different uh, multicard. So we don't have to compromise nonlinear by choosing a multicard point which is designed for linear. And improvement seven is a wide band uh, support up to 72 megabytes. So that's uh, like uh, in summary, that's what this DBBS2 uh, uh, extension standard is going to bring us. And uh, now it's uh, very close. It will talk about uh, September this year now. And uh, very quick, this aside uh, uh, from S2 extension, I want to uh, uh, bring it up. It's just I talked to one of the gentlemen. It's also his interest. It's carry ID. And we know like uh, you know, every day, the satellite operator is facing this uh, carry ID. And uh, you know, today, is, uh, if somebody is uh, affecting you, you just see the satellite guys uh, holding the phone, ask people to turn off, you know, shut off your carrier. Oh, it's not you. OK, bring it back up. Because that's the only way they can find out who is the culprit of the interference. So at, uh, set, uh, at uh, London Olympic uh, last year, u set uh, put out a statement. If you don't have carry ID, I'm not going to carry the programming for you. So that really put pressure on the, on the, uh, uh, on the guys. And uh, at that time, the quick and dirty way to do is uh, use the existing transport stream uh, structure. There is a net table in the existing uh, structure. So they just use the net table to transmit uh, the carrier ID. So basically, if you have uh, a, a transport stream analyzer, you look at the net table, the satellite op operator will know the carrier ID of uh, each carrier, which include all this, uh, uh, like, you know, uh, what kind of service, what's the serial number of the equipment, uh, what is the uplink GPS uh, location, uh, uh, coordinate of the uh, teleport, and also the telephone number. So if uh, people find it, people can call right away. And uh, that is uh, today, they're, uh, they're already in. And uh, in new tech, uh, actually, if you're talking about transport structure, this carrier ID is supposed to be in the encoder and in the multiplexer, right? That's where transport is generated. But in new tech, we also do it on our modulator, simply because, uh, uh, for example, two cases. One is, uh, how about when you want to transmit a program from Canada all the way to China? Sometimes you have to double hop somewhere, right? When you double hop, and if you don't have a way to modify the carry ID in the modulator, the information you put in the encoder is not valid anymore because the, co the coordinates of, uh, of the teleport already changed to uh, maybe Hawaii, not uh, like uh, you know, Montreal or Ottawa anymore. So that's one case. Another case you see, lots of the cases, uh, multiplexer, they feed one program to different uplink to give it to different uh, cable head end. So if you just uh, put that information in the multiplexer, it's also not going to work because you have uh, five or six different uh, kind of uh, uh, teleport uh, uplink the same program. That's why NewTek, our modulator, we also implement uh, this uh, transport stream carry ID. So if you are in that situation, you need to update your uplink information, you can do it on the modulator. You don't have to go all the way back to the uh, source of the transport stream. However, carry ID is, uh, is supposed to be an RF uh, uh, issue, not a transport stream baseband issue. That one is just quick and dirty, so uh, uh, no people can still see the 2012 uh, London Olympics. But in the meantime, actually, this uh, another is initiative in a DVB organization has been going on. It's called RF uh, carry ID. So this is uh, what's going to look like. And the draft standard is already out. So the standardization is any time, any time, can be any time now. And uh, what it does is uh, for every carrier, they have a very, very small carrier ID carrier. It's about 224 kilohertz. However, they spread it. They spread it underneath. It's so low, it doesn't affect any normal carrier to a signal to carrier uh, a carrier to noise ratio so it's not going to affect your reception but satellite operator guys if they only have one carrier id decoder they do the sweep of the whole transponder they will see all these carrier id 
underneath. So if there is interference to happen, they don't even need to interrupt any valid service. They just go inside it and say, if they see a carry ID which is not even supposed to be there. So this is a RF carry ID by a DVB organization. And this is a standard. And uh, this is uh, the last uh, update uh, from DVB uh, organization on DVBS2, the one I mentioned on the wideband uh, 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 carrier for KA uh, transmission. So KA, now you're talking about like 250 megahertz. Think about that. Today, if you want to find a receiver which can do 45, 60 megabot, you're pretty happy because the higher the sample rate you go, it's like the higher the modulation you go, it put lots of processing on the decoder of the receiver because you have to calculate all this kind of uh, uh, decoding stuff uh, there. So that's why every time like uh, you see sample rate get bigger and bigger is because you have a better and better FPGA or ASIC. So just imagine you have a 200 uh, mega symbol signal coming down. You, you, if you don't do something, you are not going to have a receiver which can be affordable by lots of people. So one thing DVB uh, organization proposes, uh, they introduce something called a time slicing number. So imagine if you have a 250 megahertz carrier, inside there are going to be lots of lots of TV programming. Not everybody might need it. So if you can find a way to slice them and go by service, and then the receiver look at the physical layer header before they decode, they look at the physical layer header, they go look for this time slicing number. Then they can say, OK, this is a service meant for me. Then they will only decode that part of service meant for him instead of decode the whole world uh, 250, uh, uh, 200 uh, plus uh, mega symbol signal, and then filter the programming at the baseband. That's a very efficient way. So what they are trying to do is, okay, I'm going to give you a time slicing number representing the service, and I'm going to put it in the physical layer header. So the receiver first go to physical layer header, find out what service is meant for you, and then you only decode that part. Other, you just throw it away. Don't do it. Don't do it at the baseband. So that will be very efficient. I'll also make a reasonably priced receiver uh, possible. OK, that's uh, all I have today. And uh, thank you very much for the time. And uh, if you have uh, any question, I would be glad uh, to answer as uh, many as I can. Yes. No, but yeah. So uh, you are you are you are very you are uh, you you follow it uh, very closely. So actually, this thing pop up is because uh, Lova said uh, claim they have something much better than DVBS two, right? And uh, yeah, you know, given what I said, New Tech is a strong believer of a DVB organization. So we are not going to let the DVB. Uh, you know, at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, let them have upper hand. So you will see Novaset, they call it NS3. Right now, according to the computer simulation, what you are going to see is going to be slightly better than them. Slightly better than them. But the big difference is this is open standard. This is not preparatory. And I don't believe uh, maybe some point to point uh, Novaset can still survive, or some some uh, cases uh, they really need that efficiency. Otherwise, the broadcaster setup uh, nobody is going to like uh, 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 preparatory, and the preparatory not going to make a receiver cheaper. No way. If you want to make a receiver cheaper, you have to open. You have to make it ASIC. If you want to stay at FPGA, the best one, eight hundred bucks, is going to kill you. Forget about anything else. So, so far, 
we believe it's going to be slightly better than Novaset. If today Novaset uh, uh, publish uh, their uh, number out, then we can we can compare one by one because we uh, 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 we publish and also like uh, DVB organization is going to define what will be the S signal to noise ratio per mod cut point. Oh. Yeah. That's much better because the carrier ID, another uh, big player is a Comtech, the meta carrier, the technology. And uh, now they are part of this organization, so it will be homelized. So today you can still buy their uh, stuff, but you have to put up uh, both sides using their stuff. They have a standalone uh, uh, box, but uh, now they are already part of this uh, 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 group, so it will be something come out uh, harmonized. It's much better than the other <laughs> story you mentioned. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Waylon. Thank you for your time. Yeah. And I'd like to present a certificate in uh, recognition for uh, his uh, time to come and exchange with us today. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>Voici back, j'ai vu beaucoup de, nouveau, de nouvelles figures ce soir que je ne connais pas. Alors, si vous avez quelques minutes pour échanger avec nous en arrière, ça nous fera plaisir d'apprendre de, de à vous connaître. Alors, merci beaucoup.